Let's have a show of hands of who's back with us. Nobody. <laughs> oh no, it's all coming through. Getting off the half. Quite a few. Let me just check and see. Um, there's a particular question. Oh, I don't know. Is it Juan? Are you around? Because you asked a question about our studio and IT departments. Are you there? Just put your hand up saying if you're there. No, he's not. Anna, are you okay? Oh, there you are. Right, because I didn't want to answer the question. Are you not be there? Um, you just wanted to cover our experiences of installing our and our studio in terms of admin rights and NHS departments. We were very lucky in our trust, which is a large trust, because I think the people who showed interest a few years ago were very uh, high ranking, let's say. There were a couple of medics wanted to use it and IT just didn't quite understand it and let it happen. So we have full access to the packages, but there are some places where they have outsourced admin. So they have to pay each time IT installs packages for them, which really takes away some of their rights. So it varies across NHS, local authorities, public health. NHS X are trying to write a one-stop document to say, this is what, that's all right. They're trying to do a one stop, like this is how you do it. This is what's acceptable. This is what not, was not acceptable. These are all the imp security implications. Our security person specifically said for R, he sees no reason why not to use it. There's been no problem with uh, viruses or bugs in the packages that could uh, be a security risk. He doesn't have that same confidence with Python. So only a couple of us are allowed Python access, but it's just restricted access to individuals, not open up to everybody but our whole trust is allowed to use it now because we've removed the licenses for SPSS for the um, statistical packages because they're quite costly and they weren't all being used and that's actually impacted a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists in our trust who did their own research so it varies is the problem and some places it's easier than others and trying to convince IT it's a good thing I was talking earlier about Slack so even with Slack which is a a conversational area where you can go I'll just show you now because I've actually got it open on the right bit this is what my slack looks like I've made it go black because I like black screens it doesn't have to look like that but you have all these different channels where you can chat with people some of them are closed uh, we don't have many and you can have um, individual conversations with people so those are my conversations that I have with people in my team that nobody else sees so they're like direct messages so all of this stuff, this is the place to go for help with R, help with Shiny, new to Slack. And as I said, I've posted questions myself and I've posted a question about Summarize. I could have done that on Stack Overflow. I could have done that out in um, Twitter or, or ask people directly, but I quite like asking it in here because other people benefit from it as well. So the, the, as I said, no question is too simple. I asked a question of my manager, Chris Beely, who you'll see if you signed up to the Shiny workshop about something I was using, and I can't remember what it was now, he eventually went to Hadley Wickham on Twitter and said, is this right? And Hadley said, oh, it's a bug. So even a really simple question where I thought I was doing something wrong turned out to just be a bug. But I would have had no confidence to go to Hadley Wickham and go, is this right? Because Hadley Wickham has been doing this a very long time. I had to go through the channels to get that. But that's what I mean, no question is too simple. So thanks for coming back. And so I've just gone over a little bit of our issues with getting R and R Studio, even Python, because that's another way that people are getting into it. Um, and I'm going to cover ggplot2. Normally in the course it's first, but I was a bit worried that we wouldn't have enough time, but I think we will do. I will skim over a few bits because we've only got an hour, certainly before the next workshop, and I think people will be starving unless they've got some food. So. I am going to do, as we did before, first of all, is go to a new script. So I went up to file, new file, our script. Just to clear that. The other way, as I sort of mentioned before, which is good, is to go to session, shift, control shift F10 will work, I think. I'm not sure if it will work in, in the cloud, but you can just restart everything. So it clears all of this bit up here where the objects were. It starts a, a new console session. It means that everything's white though. So if I start doing the ggplot2, it won't work because I need to do library tidyverse. Tidyverse, because it's a package of packages, ggplot2 is in tidyverse, but you can call it on its own. 
So the acknowledgement for this course, which you've seen before, if you were here to see the uh, future learning, was the R for Data Science, written by Hadley Wickham and Jarrett Grolmund, who doesn't get so much of a kind of like upbeat thing. But lots of people have contributed to this as well, I think. If it's been, it's available on the web and people can contribute, you can do pull requests through it to say it was a spelling mistake or something isn't quite right. Chapter three specifically, it says. And as for Dplio, as I mentioned before, there are other packages. Mike, have you got a question? Hi, yeah, sorry, it's just a quick one about yeah. uh, when you're wanting to save what you've done, because I'm wanting to save what I've done yes. uh, in the first session. Yes. And it's, uh, there's the options of just uh, save as or, or save all. And I, I'm wondering, like, what will they save? And when I go on to save, uh, there's no file type, and, and so what file type should I save it as? It should, it does on mine, I think it defaults to .r, but that's the file type you're looking for for scripts. I'm not sure with save all, I think it would be all of your open files. Oh. I've never done that. And you're on the cloud as well, are you, or on your desktop? I oh, this, this is for the Sorry. desktop one at the moment. Okay. So if you did save as, and then called it, R. Great here. It's just. It will appear in my workshop here somewhere. Example. Dot R is what I shall yes. use. Yes. Good point. Thanks. I forgot that bit. Thanks. So back to the slide. There's a good deviation though. It's really useful. Um, ggplot2 is not the only plotting package. There are lots of packages that use ggplot2 or similar. And base R, you can create uh, very quick and uh, simple charts, not simple in statistics, but simple to create. But ggplot2 gives you more flexibility on colors and changing it. What you'll find if you have seen any with the COVID-19 charts, Financial Times have done some really nice charts. BBC have done them as well. They've all, not all of them, but quite a lot of them were created in R. So you have a lot of flexibility in having a theme that you can use. And so this is a, an old poll from somebody off Twitter saying they mostly use ggplot2, but some people do use a mixture of things. So you will see that. Plus there are different packages for different types of chart. So um, I don't think ggplot2, I'm going out on a limb, do pie charts, but there'll be a package out there that does the contentious pie chart. Some people love them, some people hate them. Why is ggplot2? Two, as it is now, I think there might have been a Gigi plot before, popular. Well, it, it, these are the three reasons. I think it's also because it comes in tidyverse. It kind of follows that logic. You can pipe into it. You can add to it. It has a slightly different grammar, but it does fit nicely with the dplyr. It does really do some attractive graphics. I have found it to be quite tricky to run this course and also to use it to get it just how I wanted it. Whereas Excel, you can click and you can control it with your, your mouse and things. But once you've got your script, you can just reuse it over and over again. That's where it comes into its own. So it's a really steep, intense work, learning curve, say, at the beginning. But once you've got that, you can reuse it. That's the beauty of using script programming and analysis. You can do heat maps as well, if people have seen as well, some really glorious looking things and really quickly, which is quite nice. So ggplot2 is part of the tidyverse. And so I've done it already. I put library brackets tidyverse at the top. So we're going to explore a data set for the NHS. Pressures in A&E, which is, is unfortunate because that is always our issue, but there's certainly at the moment with coronavirus. So we have demand, we have capacity, we just want some charts on some of our AME data. So the data set that we did load earlier, but I've now cleared it, we'll just go through again, because it's good practice. If you have it open already, feel free to follow and do it again. If not, just follow me. I was doing up here an import data set before going to read R, but I'm going to do this other thing here as well, where you can just click on your CSV file. And gives you two options, view file or import data set. So I'm going to do import data set that way. And so I don't need to go and browse to it because I've already told it which one to look for. And so I can see it. This was the one that we didn't have to do anything to. So I'm just going to copy that line. I don't need the read R bit because it's already in tidyverse. And I'm going to do cancel just so that it's in the script. So if I ever use that script again, control and enter 
and it runs your runs it to an object and now you can see it there it is so it's got data from 2017 to 2018 based on nhs benchmarking network it's called capacity ae up here we've got 68 observations which relate to rows and five variables which relate to columns it's a data frame in this context. A data frame in my head is very much like SQL tables, very much like Excel. You've got your variables in columns and your observations in rows. It refers back to the tidy data and that format of having things in a long form. The other thing that you may see referred to in dplyr, and this just comes up in this particular bit, is Tibble. Tibble is a uh, it's a data frame, but it's got a bit more about it. It's been created by the Tidyverse team and it's worth having a bit of a Google about tibbles because it's about the structure of the, the data. So when you're manipulating it, it does, it does make life a bit easier. So what they've done is they've taken the data frame and added it and done a little bit more to it to make it even more user friendly. So on the face of it, it works exactly the same as a data frame. You can do pretty much the same things with them, but you can just do a little bit more. I think it's just a bit more manipulatable when you're looking at the data structure. And I think Tibble may be the name because I haven't mentioned this before, but Hadley Wickham is from New Zealand, which is nice because it means that he's or they have sort of championed the fact that we can use some of our UK spell spellings in the, the, the code. So we can use summarise with a Z or summarise with an S and it sees no distinction. So that's really nice that we've got this international inclusive view, even on the language that we use. So as we've done before, this is refreshing everything again, which is quite nice. We can look at the, um, the we can look at the object, sorry. Click on the text in the environment pane and it can open up in the, uh, I've forgotten the names of it, not console. Okay, good. Yeah. Environment pane, I think it says to the viewing frame. Okay. MPG is used here actually, which we haven't installed because that's a pre-installed data set. There are a couple of data sets that are pre-installed. This is about cars. You'll also see something about the Iris data set that's in there. And there's a new one about penguins. People have moved away. You might've heard that conversation because of the person who used the data set Iris and where it first appeared was in eugenics. So people are moving away from it. It's kind of a sign of the inclusivity of the R community that they're trying to be more sensitive to even the history of statistics and have moved away from certain things that might have historical connotations, which are not very nice now. Viewing the data frame, we can click to see the data frame in a new window, which is really useful because sometimes it's all cramped in. You may be cramped in on this screen and you want it floating around while you do your code, but flipping between can be a bit tricky. So if you click on this little arrow that's between the arrow going left and filter, it will pop out. Now, not everybody's will necessarily work on your um, cloud if you haven't allowed for pop-up screens. So if it doesn't work, it's possibly our studio cloud rather than you not finding the right button. So it just floats around, which makes it a bit easier to toggle between things. Viewing the data, we sort of looked at that before, so this kind of over, go, overlapping some of the stuff we did before. So you can write capacity AE, control and enter, and it will just show you your data. And you can look at your data in various different ways. So we have a couple of questions. How many sites um, do we understand the variable names and what they mean? So we start with site here. We've got the numbers, these are like codes which are just actually in row numbers, aren't they? Attendances, staff increase, meaning did it increase or did it not increase between 2017 and 18? D cubicles and D weights. Mine's not showing D weight. I'll have a look here. D weight is there, it just wasn't showing on this for some reason. Oh, D weight was cut because I couldn't quite see it all, but it is there. They're the differences in the averages from 2017 to 2018. Bit of advice for, for charts. The simple graph has brought more information to the data analyst mind than any other device. One of the benefits to using ggplot2, it being part of Tidyverse, is it when you get some code working, it's really nice to look at your data and actually just look at it. So we get, I get very used to looking at tabular data. 
but sometimes when you put it into a chart, you can suddenly see the pattern. And that can be really useful uh, just to see outliers. So if you've got age ranges of people suddenly seeing that somebody's been listed as 200 years old, you might not see that in a whole list of data, but if you put it into a chart, then suddenly see that somebody's out at 200 years old. So it's a data error issue, but just looking at your data in a graphical form can really give you just an instant insight into something particularly for data quality. Graphics with ggplot2, this is gray, so you can't quite see it, but it says two behind it. Is there a change in the number of cubicles available in AE associated with a change in the length of attendance? We're going to use the ggplot2 for this. And when we do charts, starting off in this, is just to think about the kind of chart you would use for this. The suggestion here is we probably look at the length of attendance on the y axis, the upward one, and changing the cubic number of cubicles on the, the x. This is how charts are. You sort of have to think about how they work. I tend to plow in and just chart them, graph them, if that's a verb, and then see how it works. That's not really my area, clearly, because I just throw it in there and see if it works OK. This is trying to suggest, quite rightly, that you should give it a bit of thought beforehand. So I'm not sure if everyone can see that because, again, it's like grey. The question is repeated. So we're trying to use this new code structure here. I'm going to type it out because it, it doesn't copy from the presentation slide too well. And then I'll put it into the chat. So I'm looking at ggplot. I don't need to write the two when I'm calling the verb because I've, I've raised it. ggplot2 is the name of the package. ggplot is the verb itself. I'm looking at data, and for this I write out data equals what it is that, that I'm looking at, AE. And this, rather than using those pipes, it uses just the plus sign, which is quite nice to see the difference in things. So you, you can see if you see a plus sign, you get used to going, oh, that's a chart. And if you see a pipe, you go, well, that's the data manipulation. And as I said, they mix, but you have to be careful about how you mix them because they do distinctly different things. And on this one, I'm going to do geom point AES x equals, this is the x-axis, d cubicles, if I can do cubicles, I'm hoping it will find it for me, it's not, I'll just have to write it out, and y equals d weight. So if I do control and enter, you get the plot in this little screen here, in the bottom quadrant, it's using this tab here, plots. There's a note in there, and I sort of raised it before, that r is case sensitive. So if something's called count with a little c, it's distinctly different from count with a big c. That has an impact if you say have male, female as a category group, some male have capital M, some are little, some are just, you know, it, that, that's when you need to clean your data. So for the ggplot2, we begin with the plot main verb. Inside it, we're plotting data. And then th these are called layers where we've got the plus and you can add multiple layers to it, very much like the pipe structures where you could add layer after layer. In a sense, it wasn't a layer, it was a, an action on top of an action on top of another one. This one is um, layers. In Pen and paper, I didn't ask you to do this, but you can kind of just think it through and I'm going to ask for a show of hands in a second. We want to move the data to a, a chart. This is just a tiny, tiny data set. And the question is, what kind of chart would you like to see this data in to get the most meaning from it? Given that it's a year over three bits and times. I'll just give you a few seconds to think about that. I think probably what the question should also be, what should you not use? Because <laughs> when I did this a few times, I just facetiously said, I think, a pie chart. So hands up. Who would use a pie chart? Anna said not a pie chart. Mm. No. Well, I should do. I should do hands up for not a pie chart because I think that's probably a bit more free. And then if everybody sees it and they did want a pie chart, they can just quickly put in a thing. Only Anna. Anna's there. Bar chart says, "Yeah, that's a more time." Um, or line chart or doc chart maybe. What's it called? I forgot my document. Scatter. Scatter says that. Forgot the word. So just kind of think, you don't, you don't need to say because it will slow things down trying to get everyone to talk. What kind of reasoning behind it, particularly about the pie chart, that's a really good one. So there are lots of choices to be made in the type of chart you use, but also how you chart it. So we're going to represent different shapes. We could have 
geometric. That's the key part here. It's in red because it's trying to show geom, which is here for the, the geom meaning geometric. And AES, which we've written here, which again is in red here, is the aesthetic. I'm trying to get it away from being red. The attributes you want to give to your geometric shape. So you can change the shape, the size, the position, position X, position Y actually, and color. So this is where you get the flexibility within your coding. You can do this with base R, but it takes a lot more coding. And ggplot2, I guess, is actually on top of base R. So it's just making base R available in a bit more of an easier fashion. So it's very powerful. There's a lot to it. And I try to think of charting things, graphing things as the the coding behind it. So you can do it very easily, incredibly easy in Microsoft Excel and Power BI with clicking and dropping. But this is like the fixed script behind it that we never see when we do it in Excel, unless somebody does CBA or macros or something like that. I'm not too sure myself. So there are lots of things that you can control within those function brackets about the sizes and things. Functions. So again, it's like functions and verbs. They kind of call it more functions in ggplot2 and verbs in dplyr, but they're interchangeable, I think. I use them interchangeably. And quite a lot of them have zero inputs, as it said, which is just bracket bracket. So you're just saying do this, but you're not saying specifically anything else. You don't need to. You can name arguments explicitly. So we said data equals this is the data object you're using, or you can just run it with just name of the data object. It's quite nice. There's no problem with continuing to do data equals. It's good practice to sort of, in the beginning, practically write it all out. So then it just becomes a bit more familiar because it's slightly different to anything else we, we do in coding. It says, provided you get your arguments in the correct order, because what's interesting is you could actually switch these, and I have done this, and I guess this is bad practice, and it's not a really nice idea to do that but you can switch them around just by switching what you're referring to. But if you weren't to put the X equals and the Y equals, you have to get those in the right order because that's left is always X and right is always Y. I think I've covered this. It will refault. Yes, yeah, so it refers to the default values. And again, just to, to clarify again on help, if you highlight the verb or you put your key in it and then do F1, you can have the help file in your R Studio file, which is quite good if you lose connection to the internet, for example, you'll still have your help files available that you would have had on the internet. So you do a lot of shorthand. I'm not shorthand. I'm going to leave it all longhand. I'm not going to get rid of the X and the Ys because it's good practice for me to know where things are and I've already written it out. You have lots of geons, lots of possibilities, bar line, box plot and histogram. So there's lots of different things. I'm, as I said before, I'm not sure pie chart features, but you can do, there's a package for Venn charts separate to this. Um, there are heat maps, there, there are all sorts of things. Today we're just going to do the geon point, which is really like a scatter graph. And we've got one here. We can add another layer to it. And we're just going to start with geon. And actually you get all of the list of things you can do. There's, there's hundreds actually. There's, there's loads. That's really exciting. I haven't used half of those. So we want to add on this one, it says a geon smooth layer to help identify the patterns. So my plot is still here. I'm just on the help uh, tab. If I go to plots, I've switched my X and Y back around the right way. So I'll just highlight that so you can see it the right way around. And if I do geon smooth, I think you have to say what your geon smooth is, sorry. If you copy what your smooth is, I forgot that you have to put in what it means, what you're referring to in your smooth. And then you have to be at the top of ggplot2 to, oh no, it does run it. It then gives me this kind of, it's not a warning, it's just an information line. It's saying the method that was used for it was Lois, which is the type of statistic used to create the smoothing function on it. And you can change what that is. So if I 
click on there and do F1, it gives me specifically what Geon Smooth does. So it tells me all the different things you can use in it. But I tend to, as I've said before, go down to the bottom to see what you can do with it here. So you can change all sorts of statistical things. And this, what we're going to do here is change the method is very much like this, where we say method equals LA. So you have to be careful of your brackets. So I've done this bracket here, I'll split it out so you can sort of see that it corresponds with the line 12 next to Geon Smooth. And then method, not method, method equals LN. So it's a linear model now it's working with. Default was lowest, so it warned you that about that. And that's the chart. This is a, a the line, the sort of trend line that was going in there, the blue, I think. And the question is, what is happening with these two bottom bit, two dots down here? That's where charts kind of show more interest than data. And I, and I love the data side of it, but charts do have a place to play in understanding your data in a different way. Any ideas? I put some hypothesis up there. You can feel free to throw out your chat. I struggled with this when I showed some people last week, but there are some people much better placed with this than me. They suggested that these two were getting good results, but not necessarily for the same um, initiative. So they haven't, they may have, the, the question here is, has staff increase had the effect of reducing the weight, even though the cubicles numbers are very low, whereas everybody else, it's all been related to the numbers of weight is related to the cubicles themselves as like a, a direct correlation. And to do that, we can map the color of the staff increase, which was a binary, has it increased or hasn't it, true, false. Which would give you an idea of whether those two at the bottom outliers have anything to do with staff increase or not. And to do that, we can change the color within the particular points. So um, I'll get rid of, I'll copy it, sorry. I'll copy that whole section. I'm just going to copy the presentation slide itself. So I'm going to leave the X and the Y all written out. But instead, what it has here is color with a U equals, I'm going to put it on a new line, equals staff. That's because I've got smooth in here. I don't want smooth, sorry. I was mixing things. There we go, slightly different. I'm just going to zoom, which means it gets a, pops it out into a new screen. So you can see where false means there was no change, true, there was a change. So there were a couple up here scattered where there was a staff change. But notably, the ones that we were looking at, there was a staff increase. So maybe that is the reason why the wait time is lowered, even though the, the D weight is lowered, even though the D cubicles are still quite low. No, the other way around. Yeah, D weight's low, cubicles are quite low. Any questions or problems? And what we've oh, done is we've, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to type in this staff increase, but it, it's saying it can't see it. But when I open up Capacity AE, it's definitely there. As, I just uh, post my code in the chat. If you've got the thing that I always get caught out about is these brackets as well. So you have to make sure it's a good idea, Don. If you could post yours too, that might help. Brackets and commas are very, very common issues within ggplot2 and making it see and read stuff. You really do struggle with a lot of those. Ooh, sorry, I'm going ahead. So while you're doing that, just to sort of explain, you can change your arguments inside 
the AES. So this relates to your point color, but you can also change it outside of your AES as well. So what we're going to do is just concentrate on these dots and what aesthetics we have related to them. So we've tied the color to staff increase, but we can also change the color all of it. So we can just say color equals a color. Red isn't really very friendly. I might be blue. Let's see blue. Where some people find red difficult to distinguish. And I haven't actually worked there. <laughs> that's not done it. Oh, I just called it blue. Uh, that's because I need a bracket. The colour I was changing, I was just naming it within the aesthetic. I needed to change the colour outside of the aesthetic. I'll post that one as well. I've made it blue rather than red, because red can be difficult to distinguish. So as I did say, and I kind of warned, where your brackets go is really, really important and it, you can still get caught out even if you've used it a few times. You can change the size as well. So I'm going to leave it as blue. No, I'm not. I'm going to change it. I'm going to follow the rules. I'm just going to just put it after size equals four. And then they're really big and they default to black. Now, this is where I think ggplot2 comes into its own and really is key for charts because it's really nice to create a chart, but it's so easy to go, well, I can just do that in Excel. It's very easy to do. But what you can't do is in Excel very easily without a lot of work is to reproduce the same chart tens and hundreds of times. So I've used statistical process control charts, which you can get on some Excel um, for, uh, templates from NHS Improvement. They're really good. But you might need to do that for 100 teams or 100 categories of X or Y. And QI charts 2, which I've used, is based on ggplot2, which allows for this facet so this is a very basic facet, but you just have to kind of think about what it would be like to produce a really nice chart that you spent hours on. Even five times would be quite mind blowing and quite, quite a lot of work to do. So data equals capacity AE plus, I'm just going to copy actually, G on point. Just copy all of this. I'm going to leave all the um, X's and Y's and details. So if I just run that, work because I haven't got a closed bracket. Nope. AE, G on point, AES, DQ equals G I have to go at the top of the ggplot to run it, sorry. So this is one of the things where in dpi you can click it anywhere in the script. ggplot2 you have to either be at the top end or highlight the entire script, which is a bit awkward. But there you go, so that's the basic chart. So a new layer, facet, wrap, bars, which I forget what it refers to. I think it's like, I use something slightly different. I can't remember what it's called now. Hey, you're dropping out again, I'm afraid. Oh, that's okay. Because I was at the bit where I was like, I don't really know what that is. What does bars mean? Is it um, vari variables, isn't it? Variables, right. Did you do explain, I might have something... explain what AES meant as well. Um, yes, aesthetics. It's short for aesthetics, so that would be the colours and the sizes. Yep. Yeah. So facet wrap here, vars, refers to the variables that you're going to look at. So we want to do a chart that does two charts for the staff increase. I want to see the staff increase for those who have and those who haven't. So I want to do that chart twice, essentially. I'm just going to run it. As I said, this is a very basic wrap where you've got two. And often it's not that difficult to do a chart twice, but it's when you get to the five and the 10 and the 15, even a hundred times, facet wrap just does it for you. So it will just take your code and facet it by all the categories that you've got on in your, in your table. And so it can do it multiple times. They get smaller. And so things are a bit harder to read sometimes, but the ease of doing it is incredible because it's just one line facet wrap. You can also change how they're laid out. So this has n col. I'll copy this out, run it, and then put it in the chat. So it looks a bit better that way. 
on top of each other rather than side by side. You can do it by more than one group as well. So you could have it kind of like a cross tab thing. So you, you can do lots of things with it. It's very flexible. Uh, just have to be careful of meaningfulness because sometimes you can do, and I've done this where I've done something and then I was like, I don't actually know what I've put in a chart anymore. I've, I've lost track of where it is. So breaking it down like you would do in the other bits with dplyr is really useful. They're all called categorical variables. So this facet wrap is usually on words as opposed to numbers. So it's like the names of um, departments you have or male, female in gender, sex categories or ethnicity groups, that kind of thing. Is everybody OK? Hands up if you need a bit more time or questions. Okay. Demonstrating. Oh, yeah. Sorry, so I'm just worried about time because you have yeah, like, got half an hour. Sure, and the same Zoom links. Well, not same Zoom, but same Zoom account. So um, we might have yeah. to up soon. Yeah. So what the ch the presentation goes into next, which I thoroughly recommend you work through each slide because that's what we would do in the presentation, is doing other charts. So it covers histograms, how to control or bins, how many, you know, what goes into each group that you have in your histogram and bar plots. You can order in your data. So you don't have to necessarily order outside of your data. You can do it within. So it, that, that gives that flexibility that it has the same, well, not verbs because it's called reorder, but it's, you know, it's got similarity with your DPIF and other tidyverse packages. Box plots as well. Box plots are really hard to do in Excel. They're not impossible. They're just really hard. So if you to do them multiple times, I'm just going to do one really quickly because it just looks very stunning. I'm just going to do plot capacity. And I'm just going to copy it from this sheet geom underscore box plot AES aesthetics staff increase the weight. And there we go. A few lines of code and I've got box plots. That would be really quite difficult to do in Excel. And you can't do that in SQL at all because it's not the same kind of thing at all. So that's when it comes into its own. The next bit you want to do is to put titles in and Y axes so you can control those. I, I won't go into it too much because we're a bit pressed for time, but it's just to ensure that just to let you know that you can do this. And there's a number of ways of doing it. And that's when I would say to refer back to, if you can, that chapter, I really should read it myself. There's so much detail out there for charts. What will happen, and this is a good sign in your learning, is when you start doing something and think, I just want to do this, which is not, it wasn't even covered in the course, wasn't even something that you think you could, it's just like, I want to do this now. How do I do that? I want to take this a bit further you're learning and that's a really good sign when that happens. And I do that a lot. I look at something and go, yeah, I like that now. I just want to do this with it. I just want to tweak that. I still do that. As was raised before about saving your script, which I forgot to say, which is really key, you can save your plots as well. Now you can do it a number of ways. You could actually save it from the Zoom, not the Zoom, sorry. You can export, sorry, there's next to the Zoom. And you can also write it into your code. So every time you run the code, it just exports it to um, a PNG. So you can do a plus, that's another layer, GG save, use quotation marks around it, dot underscore name, dot PNG. And then when you run that, it says saving. If I look at my file structure and I'm looking for plot name, it's there at the bottom, plot name dot PNG. Just a line of code and it saved it and if I open it if I can I think it's shown up somewhere else actually it's just hidden behind my zoom there we go it's now in my picture and I can resize it and do all the things I want to do with my my script uh, my picture photograph software you can change its size as well so you can do the units which is this one's centimeters height and width but you can also do that in your um, photo software. You, this goes back to what does the function do? I'm just going to go over it again because it is really useful to know because you, it's very easy to get stuck with stuff. You do GG save and it will give you 
some of the information. If you don't finish off the, the word, if you write E, then it gets rid of it because it thinks, oh yeah, you know what you wanted. But if I wasn't too sure and I wanted to read stuff, that's like a really high level summary. It's really good when you can't remember what it was that you needed to put in because you know it needs some variables. F1 we've covered and the question mark, two question marks is something I've learned today. So you don't have to have the package open. Google is also a good way as well. And you sometimes find that you get back to these kind of help files. Save your script, which is why we didn't save it before. So just so that you know, you can go to file, save as, and then you can select your structure. Always dot R, we just do control S. And other recommended reading, particular and visualizations. Um, these are all free, again, online. So if you're okay with reading things online, that's good. And if you want to go to um, published versions, then they're available as well. Some people, I'll see if this opens. There's a, a Twitter link, I think, called uh, Accidental Art. It was a, it's a, a Twitter account. Because people make mistakes, which can be sometimes beautiful. And if my thing loads, eventually, you get some interesting things on there. But that's, that's quite pretty. So people share their mistakes in a really lighthearted, sometimes just appreciating that it can all go a bit, a bit awry. But sometimes they're, they're really fascinating. Yeah, one of the writers of, of ggplot actually intentionally makes art with... Um, yes. I don't know if you've seen any of his stuff. Yeah, there's a couple of data scientists I follow who sell their art as well, or they they try to. Uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't quite know what they do with it, but it's amazing, stunning. Some of the stuff they come out with. So just to point out this last bit, which is an addendum, quickly is that it's the point here is that it's repeated here. So you've got your G on point A S D cubicles D weight, and then it's repeated on the same line with A S D cubicles D weight. The danger of any duplication is that you can make mistakes in, in your words and it also makes it a little bit harder to see because you might get a, a letter wrong and it's not so easy to, to do. And the best way of doing that is because it's repeated is to take it outside of those two lines. So as I referred back, these presentation slides are good to go through, but it's just to show you that the same chart will run if you just move the AES from these points themselves up here to the main part. So if I quickly show you, where did I have it here duplicated? So if I moved that up there without the duplication of those and without the brackets, and I need to remove that. There we go. So I got the same chart, but just fewer words because they were the positioning had changed of the words. So the aesthetic is outside of the layers, but it, it's in the global. So it applies to all of your layers. So it will work for both point and for smooth. But if you wanted the point to be different to smooth, you have to put it in there. So definitely go away and look into it a bit more and read about it and try a box plot because box plots are really cool. And any other questions, because we've got a quarter of an hour, I think I've whipped through. If we don't have any questions, I can show you some of the examples of what people have done. Anything that anybody wanted to go over briefly again? If anyone doesn't want to speak, then I can, if you type it out. Yeah, do chat, chat yeah. Read it out, just anything on R or anything we covered. Yeah, any questions at all, any general questions too. Um, mine is just a stupid question about scheduling and stuff. Mm. Um, so tomorrow afternoon, I've got my introduction to GG Plot. Oh, that's cool. It'd be much better than what I've just done. 
Oh, right. I was about to say, will it just be the same as this? No, I'll, I'll speak no, right here. no, no, definitely do it. <laughs> no, well, well, yes. Nice. Uh, yeah, just uh, quickly update. So yes, Mike, uh, our workshop will be going ahead as usual. It's just Zoe has kindly agreed to also um, add a few lines about uh, ggplot2 because unfortunately ggplot2 is quite limited capacity. Uh, but I will see you tomorrow. Oh yeah, no, that, that's great. And, and thanks Zoe. It's a lovely little uh, intro, especially yeah. for the dangers of a misplaced bracket. Uh, yes, I always do them. I solve my problems after finding them. I think what's nice is if you go into to several things, it will help re-establish, you know, like it just gets it in there. Oh, I've seen this before. I'm going to do this again. And I'm going to. So my learning was very much I did two or three workshops before I sort of even started to kind of understand what my R studio was all about, like where it's all set up. So really, I, I, some oh, people are brilliant and get it straight away. I think is. Yeah. That's... And seeing it a few times, because this is yeah. the first time. For many people that you've seen <laughs> programming behind a chart or behind your data if people are predominantly excel users sql references that i've made will be really baffling oh I, yeah i am and some of my co-workers uh, have been using r uh, but i've heard that it's got a savage uh, learning curve at the start but yes. uh, they've made some very pretty graphs really yeah. um and i i've had a look at their code but i kind of you know, yeah. could vaguely see what was going on, but wouldn't be able to construct it myself. Uh, but no, that, this is great. Cheers. Thank you. And different people have different styles. So my managers and their old code, uh, they've got base R in and I to be familiar with that. I'm like, well, oh, that's a base R. That really should be like this. And the translation thing comes eventually where you're like, I don't want to do it like that. I want to do it like this. So you can see people's transition in their code learning. So people who taught themselves are amazing, but you can also see in their <laughs> yeah. old code how they've learned it over time because it's so flexible it's like english in a sense how varied our english is and how it's grown over time from various it's like a real language to me anyway that people have taken bits from here and everywhere and done all sorts of stuff and it can be a real hodgepodge and then it it develops into other areas so you've got written english you've got standard english oxford english queen's english we've, and then you've got well, well, the, you've the got english you use at home Oh, sorry, I was thinking, and then you've got you've us, got what, you know, who would, us, uh, <laughs> us. not you, uh, Zoe, or the NHS teams, or whatever, the people just coming along, oh, yes. using yes. very basic formulaic words, while people look at us saying, isn't that adorable, and pat us, but soon yeah. enough, uh, with a bit of practice, I'm hoping I'll, I'll get some Yeah, so, thank you. so definitely get to the Slack group as well, and I'm, ask I'm, those I'm questions enjoying. there, and um people will be clambering to help because we really want everybody to get there. And as you say, it's not, it is savage, but it's just so uncomfortable and unusual. Mm. And you all, you've got time pressures. So you want to get stuff done quickly and R is not quick when you're learning it. Because yeah. as you say that there's a lot of uh, multi uh, creation of uh, maps and charts and things like this, yeah. thing, uh, the CCG OIS um where you we've got like 120 uh different reports one for each ccg yes. i'm going to show uh, you a nice bit of this um i think this is something that andrew who wrote these he did uh, these are examples that i cut through so that we could get enough through here but i think he automated his reports here so that you get the charts funnel charts very nice and text spat out for each ccg that you're working with. i mean this is that, that's nice. unique tables and stuff and it just is the automation of it that's really nice and really key because to do that in excel okay people are dropping off now that's absolutely fine please feel free to go off um it can be really tricky and another one that i would recommend checking up on later uh, is our markdown workshop that simon wesley miller i think is something i should know because i'm helping him with this he's written a standalone r markdown thing which is very very good so that's the next stage for people when they're using their r scripts is taking it to report level it's very very good so you don't need to go to his workshop it will be brilliant but if you can't get on if you didn't go on anyway you can I'm check out his on script thursday uh yeah uh, it'll be good because i've had a sneak preview so it's this is what happens with this is the basic bit hopefully you'll go off yes. and do tons more than i've explained and feel confident enough to go out but you can go in all sorts of directions 
And if you do maps, I'm very interested because I've never done maps yet, but uh, they can be really oh, nice. Like easy as pie. Easy as pie, like that one. So that's a nice one. Yeah. So just to explain that, that's that's the free cycle um, bicycle routes that we use more most frequently in London. Possibly different now under COVID times, <laughs> but it can take them all over the place and do nice things with it. So uh, it's very nice. Thank you for uh, sticking with me with the technical issues. Oh no! I'm get no, some food no. now before uh, the next one. Yes, so thanks. oh no, I don't. I, 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 if anybody has any other questions, though, I've got a, a weird point that I've just found.